Hello and welcome to Couple with Cake Boy. With me, Cake Boy. <laughs> I'm a disco dancing Oscar Wilde reading Stryzan and ticket holding friend of Dorothy's. But enough about me. I'm here to talk with some fantastic people about their journeys over the past year online and how they've been finding lockdown. Today's guest is Eva Echo, activist, ambassador for London Trans Clinic and founder of the Pass It On campaign, which was led last year online. Pass It On campaign aimed to promote acceptance and not standards within the trans and non-binary community and was hugely successful online. I'm really excited to have Eva with me today and I hope you are too and enjoy this first episode. Exciting! (laughs) Hello! Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. Good. Nice to see. I love I love the backdrop. I have to say, oh. I see it in all of your videos and it's so cute because I can see your little like to-do list on the whiteboard behind you. <laughs> That's what keeps me grounded and keeps me organised. Yeah. I'm often looking at that. And I've even, I even had to do colour codes just so I know what's important and what needs my attention next. But yeah, it's never ending. And yeah, and what what's your cuppa and what's my in it? Yeah. Is my panda. Um, pandas absolutely love pandas hence my my logo uh, <laughs> yeah of. and coffee i'm currently drinking a uh, starbucks festive blend i have my cafetiere at the Ooh, side very nice I always stay hydrated during interviews and article work um but yeah just black no sugar just straight up I find it slaps much harder that way and gets the job done. <laughs> I've seen a couple of times on your Instagram stories where you're like, this will destroy me. And it's just like yeah. a massive <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I've got such a wee bladder. I've been running to the loo. Like so every, I have to keep one coffee and it's milky and yeah. Um, but I've got, this is, this is my mug. It's got children and maggots on it and it's from Matilda the musical. <laughs> Love it. Absolutely love it. And it's a fruit tea because yeah, too many coffees makes me anxious. So I have to I have to just keep like a fruit herbal one that's not gonna not too much caffeine. Though I don't think they have any caffeine in the fruit ones. They're usually caffeine free, but they're yeah. they're really hydrating. Um I, I find it easier to drink like green teas, flavoured teas than it is water because Same. water's bland, bland and you just think, Oh, here we go, it's that weird, <laughs> weird stuff. Whereas when it's a tea, it's more inviting. Yeah. You don't, you know, you're still drinking water essentially and it still hydrates you. But it's like you're kidding yourself into doing it and you need to dangle, well, in this case, dangle that tea bag, but you, you're doing <laughs> it. That bland bottle of water. Yeah, I'm so glad you agree because I hate drinking water. I'm like, it's like a chore that I don't want to do. I'm like, look, I'm, like, I'm really thirsty now. That means I've got to drink water. I'm, I'm really bad, especially if I'm working at my desk and or video editing and I'm there and like five hours have gone and I've not had a single drink. And I even downloaded an app where you've got to keep watering this plant. Oh, um, yeah, I've seen that app. Yeah, my, my plant lasted like a day. It just, <laughs> it's, it just... Hot forest, yeah. gone. <laughs> gone. Yeah, I mean, no, it's, it's easier when it's flavoured or it's not water when i discovered fruit teas that was a game changer and yeah my i i i really try i try and keep a water bottle by my bed but because that's the only time it tastes nice is when i wake up at 3 a.m in the morning and i'm like (laughs) yeah that's that's the only time and even then you just do sips you don't no one downs the water you just do a few sips and you straight back to bed (laughs) yeah literally i'm like i wake up in the bottle like did i even did i touch that like i swear like i drank it's just gathering dust at the moment (laughs) It's, it's been there for weeks, that glass. It's just oh, collecting no. dust on the top. No. Fruit and berries is the one for me. I drank too much ginger and lemon when I was like sick with COVID a few months ago. So uh, now I can't drink that. Yeah, I can't drink it without thinking of um, being ill, which is annoying because I love ginger. Like it's my favourite. Uh, you need to make some new associations with it. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But I ended up having like really weird dreams where like my flatmate was pregnant with a ginger root and it was really, <laughs> really odd. <laughs> There's a story in there somewhere. There is, yeah. No, I think so. Maybe, oh God. Yeah, anyway. um... (laughs) The one reason I wanted to sort of talk to you specifically as well for being just a fabulous activist and a fabulous person was how much you're sort of had been how you've been using um your online platforms to sort of really push your activism and your work like it's so it's been so cool to watch you sort of over the past year 
And I remember uh, talking to you at Pride, I think, and saying how public speaking and stuff like that was quite yeah. new to you. Yeah, I mean, um, before lockdown, version one, um, going live on Instagram, talking, I mean, I hate the sound of my own voice, and it's like one of my triggers for gender dysphoria, and doing stuff like that, I would never really have voluntarily done. Um, I mean, before this year, I'd done um, media interviews, press interviews, and that's fine because it's it's very, it's kind of a controlled environment. So you can kind of prep for it. You can you can get a read back. You can make sure that everything's okay before it goes live. In a video scenario, especially if it's live, you can't really do that. And I think it really means that you have to kind of push yourself to want to do that. I've grown to recognize I need to do more. I can't just go and speak to a reporter in a studio anymore because of lockdown or restrictions. I've got to find new ways to do it. And having a social media platform allows me to do that. And I think it also came as a turning point for my own life as well, because I've been transitioning now for three years, just over three years. And I basically decided it's not about me now. I've, I've grown considerably. Um, I'm really happy, really at peace within my journey. It's now time to kind of give back, really. Um, acknowledge the privileges that I, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to have and help those who are, are less fortunate. Um, it's such a shame that it's taken a global pandemic to develop and grow as a person. Um, but I guess, you know, we all need a kick up the ass sometimes. And for me personally, this has been a massive wake up call. Um, and I don't think I could ever go back to being that, like, that, that social anxiety ridden person before. I still suffer from social anxiety, but I think now I just think about what's in my head, what I need to do, and just think, just get over it. Just, you know, come on, push yourself. Mm. Mm, yeah and and if if you do feel anxious at the moment as well like you can <laughs> so I, cool because um it just yeah to check in on that because i'm definitely zoom tariff even now like even with people i know coming onto a zoom call i still feel quite oh and um which is i think it's just a it's a new it's not a human way of interaction unfortunately but as you say it is allowed us to stay keep together over yeah. these times and social media has been so important for that and it's interesting how you say it <laughs> it took a global pandemic for you to sort of as you say have that kick up the ass because i think a lot of people have felt that um i've talked to a few other people and they've had similar things where like they don't think if they hadn't have had this time or this sort of sudden um another world almost opening up before them with social media um, they wouldn't have been doing the things they're doing now. You have to count your blessings. It's absolutely. I, I completely agree because you, it, it's restrictive, but I think at the same time, we can't stay in the negative. Um, mental health is impacted so much because of lockdown, you know, things being so out of our control. We need to almost take control of the things that we can influence, whether it's our activism, checking in on people, um, you know, going on Zoom and interacting with more people. And it's just, it, what starts off as finding little ways to hold on to the world we used to know has become the new normal and it's become the start of the next world. It, there's that fine line between the negative and the positive. What, what's next that could stop me and hinder me from doing what I need to do for next year? Um, but at the same time, what's next? What, what are the other opportunities? Because let's face it, I mean, when I started this year, I had a plan, I had a, an idea for something to happen for the community, and it would have been quite significant, but that had to be shelved because of COVID. But at the same time, all the things that I've done, all the interviews, all the appearances, and connecting and meeting so many people, that's been as rewarding, if, if not more. So knowing that I've, I've survived this year, I've grown stronger and I can approach next year and all the plans that I actually had, I know I can do better because I've learned so much. I wanted to talk about um, how you obviously led your campaign, Pass It On campaign uh, this year, which looked incredible, was hugely successful. How was that for you leading a campaign specifically online? Because obviously that's very different to being in person with people and uh, having a community. So yeah, I just wanted to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's been difficult because 
mean, normally I would rally people, we would, you know, we'd meet, we would get together and discuss things face to face. And I think it's been really difficult because it means there's a lot more coordination, a lot more organisation involved. But I think for me, that's been the most difficult part. Um, but also a, a bit of negativity as well, because whilst the, the campaign was designed to be a positive thing to help a lot of people within the trans and non-binary community, I also got some, some negativity as well, um, which annoyingly was, was from within the community. And I think as much as I kind of expected it and prepared myself for it, it never really, when it actually happens, it really slaps much harder than, than what you anticipate. Um, so yeah, I mean, th there's been that. And normally if I was in a group or you know, we were there together, we could hug it out, we could talk and we'd have that closeness, I suppose, which adds that comfort. But you know, talking to someone on Zoom about what happened and what someone said about you and your integrity doesn't have that same effect. Um, so that that's been quite hard. Um, so this all taking place on social media, as you can say. Social media is now this very, I mean, bubbles. I mean, the words used so much these days for other things, but like a social media bubble that we now sort of live in um, can also be echo chambers, this, that, and the other. But it's very social media has become quite polarizing i've found from my experience and also it's become a place where you know like cancel culture and this that, and the other and people using the correct terms and the correct um terminology identifiers and which all of is great but as i said i like it can become quite polarizing and quite aggressive and quite hard to like you say hard to have those conversations because how how can you really have a conversation on twitter with anyone about like you know someone's identity or how someone sees the world and so yeah i i completely sympathize that must have been really really difficult especially when it's on a platform that it's a whole community from across the globe as yeah. it's not just yeah. a community you're working with in the birmingham area in the london area and wherever you're working with a global community because everything on that page is public yeah exactly and i think like from from, from when i started doing interviews and coming out and being more visible I think that's been a learning curve for me to know that you are going to come against hate. Um, you know, when you, if you do a, if you do a campaign, if you put something out there, don't always read the comments. Especially, I mean, I've learned not to read comments from press interviews whenever they then publish it on their social media because I know there will be com there'll be more hate than you know than than admiration a lot of the time, especially if it's like you know certain certain tabloids and things like that. So. I've learned what not to do so that I can keep going and keep doing what I do. Um, having hate is, is expected because as I've come to, to realize, you can't create change without rubbing people up the wrong way. You need that reaction. You need to invoke that hate to make people sit up and question. If I just came along and said, trans rights, every, you know, all trans, non-binary people deserve the same rights as cisgender people, how about it? And if everyone said, yeah, it's, you know, great, that's fine, that's, that's, that's brilliant, we're all on the same page, but it's still not going to happen. And invoking those reactions will actually cause that action to actually take place because it generates passion, it generates heat, and it's through that passion and heat that we force and we push change through Otherwise, we, we're at risk of becoming complacent. If we all agreed on trans rights today, nothing much will happen because we will all say, that's fine, brilliant, we'll sit back, legislation doesn't get passed, we're no, we're no further on in a year's time. But if we really push for it, you know, it, it can happen. And that's why sometimes having someone go against what you, you say helps because it also identifies the gaps in knowledge and the gaps in society if someone comes at you saying you know trans women aren't women i i know a lot of people who will attack them with facts one after the other and i realized i can't do that if i want someone to listen to me i need to educate them and i need to do it in in a civilized way otherwise if i attack them nobody's going to get anywhere i'm just as bad as they are um, and yeah, I think, like you say, people come 
if when people make those comments they're not there to be educated they're not there they're there to attack you just look at the comments and you think oh that's so sad you know I, I, <laughs> in, in a way that as much as they can you know comment on my my posts what they don't realize is if it's if their profile is public i can have a look at their, po their posts as well i can see who they follow and from that, I can get a gist of what sort of person they are through how they interact with other people. And I can sometimes see that, you know, you've not even read a newspaper article about trans people or anything like that. And yeah, so if I was in your position and I'm just hearing all this negativity from the media, I would think like you do. And the moment you kind of put it into that perspective, you just, yeah, you, you want to help them. You want to educate them. You want to feel sorry for them because they don't have the information and the knowledge and the lived experience you do and i think that's also something i always bear in mind with allies as well and i'm always telling allies and people within our own trans and non-binary community that we need to be patient with people we've had an entire lifetime of coming to terms with who we are questioning pulling ourselves apart to then come out to the world and say this is who we are now that's great but those that knew us they're not mind readers, you know, they've got to come to terms with who we are. They, they transition just as much as we do. They transition alongside us as they mourn and greet the person they used to know and celebrate and, and share experiences with, with the person who's come out and say, well, this is actually the real me. And, you know, I'm, I'm happy to be here. So I would say allies, if they use the wrong terminology, if they, you know, they misgender you, accidentally use the wrong pronouns it's not the end of the world we've got to stop jumping down people's throats the moment there's any bit of negativity and it's understandable we we face it from all you know we get it from all sides in the media haters around us in our own society um it's there and we are too quick to just be so defensive and i think sometimes we've got to have some compassion we've got to have patience and be able to say to people look if they get it wrong they get it wrong it's fine let's let's just move on from that let's all acknowledge that move on from it that's the only way we can learn if it's, it's difficult isn't it because as you were saying earlier you you've learned and got to that point where you don't take that personally those posts that sort of seem but obviously when you're sort of i can see a lot of trans people i know who are younger and sort of coming to terms with that because they're in such a vulnerable position as they're working their own story out as you're saying it, it's easy to be like Ah, from every sort of angle but yeah I think it is finding that ability to remain calm and yeah and pick your battles as well I think mm -hmm. that's that's so true because I've seen a lot of a wasted energy not in regards to in regards to a lot of things not just trans issues but also like you know climate change whatnot on social media where people are picking battles with certain people or organizations that just feels like whoa you need like <laughs> it feels like i feel like they're you can see them losing energy as they're sort of doing it when yeah. with little reward and i think social media is that's really difficult as well because holding people accountable and holding companies accountable is great and of course is needed but when you see one person individual taking it upon themselves to do that it's mm -hmm. really it's really draining and awful and daunting and yeah and you be careful it's not like it's just not a, a quick knee-jerk reaction as well yeah it's, it's all too easy to jump on social media when you've got something that you disagree with um and then go out there and voice it but you've got to be careful you know does anyone else think this is it just me and am i actually going to achieve anything um and for example if you went into mcdonald's and you said your service is disgusting you're so rude you don't care about your customers it's just a conveyor belt there'll be all they'll say is, sorry you feel that way. That's it. <laughs> you boycott them. That's fine, you boycott them. But yeah. who's the one losing out? Because they've got, you know, thousands of other people who don't care. And they'll continue serving those thousands of people. You're, you voicing your concern, your dissatisfaction has not actually made a, a dent at all. If, if anything, you're your grievance doesn't go further than that person who just goes, oh, sorry. And, you know, it's knowing that you're not going to get anywhere doing it that way. So if yeah. you do have an issue, then find other ways. And, and what, what ways, 
so if, if you were giving advice to someone now who has done that, what, what would you say? What, what ways is it that they should deal with that? And follow Safety that through? Is, is always something that always springs to mind because if you feel that way, first of all, think how many other people have felt that way. Um, you know, speak to each other, reach out to other people. You know, if it's, if it's a particular store, for example, if it's a store on the point of McDonald's, if it's, if it's one restaurant, you know, how many other people in your local area felt that about either this particular member of staff, the restaurant, or whether it's a wider training issue? Once you start looking at what the problems actually are, that's when you can really tackle it because it might be that person had a bad day or you, know, you might talk to other people and find that they won employee of the month so many times. It's just that one day and you just happen to be wrong place, wrong time, straight away you're thinking, oh, actually, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm going to drop it now. And you, we, we can all, you know, put our energies elsewhere. But if you talk to other people and realise, actually, there's so much more. There's, you know, the restaurant doesn't give a shit. The standards are so low. They're not actually adhering to environmental health guidelines or in any way. That's when you know, okay, well, I can go after them based on this point and then kind of strategize and do, do it that way. Um, and that sort of way of thinking comes with experience, I guess. I mean, I, I'm, I've always been like that. And that's always how I approach things. Um, but so many people are so quick to just jump on social media and, and, and then straight away, but you're not actually doing anything. So talking to people is definitely the first port of call, I would say. Yeah, I love how we've just kind of unanimously <laughs> ganged up on McDonald's here. <laughs> <laughs> this is what it is it's conspiracy against them but um but yeah no um i think and that's it and then social media is such like how social media is exactly the same as newspapers is that it it sells via triggers via um um loud big statements that are designed to give reaction and i suppose it, it's hard to not bite that and take that bait and it's not even you know it's not just trans issues um we only have to think back to earlier this year with the Black Lives Matter movement. Everyone jumped on what happened and they focused on certain points. And it became, it, we, it was too easy to overlook the systemic racism that happens within our local, local areas. And it's great that we follow that as, as a big movement, but really it needs to start from grassroots level. We need to be identifying in our local community where the issues lie target them deal with them don't just jump on that and you know and, and say you support it um but at the same time it's just because you're not focused on the us and what's going on with racism over there doesn't mean you're not anti-racism you know and, and i think with social media as well it's just too easy to put hashtag blm in your bio and instantly become part of it but it's also it's too easy for someone to go you don't have hashtag BLM in your bio, therefore you are a racist. And, you know, you could be dealing with racism on a day-to-day -day level. You don't, you know, you don't talk to people, you don't broadcast it. But if you see something and you report it or you, you, you deal with it, great. You know, you, you are making change and don't let someone come across your profile or your post and tell you that you're not doing it because you're not doing it in the same way that they're doing it. Oh, yeah, the whole sort of performative... Um, yeah allyship that's been uh broadcasted over the past year has been very sort of telling and th that's been great in a way because there's a lot of people and a lot of companies that have been held accountable for good reason and it's amazing to see i know um the proud trust for example in manchester um have been hiring a lot of uh, people of color for their reach out sort of charity work specifically for people of color which is great because that you see then that sort of not saying it's fixing it or anything like that but mm. there's this sort of systemic change in that it's not just white cis people at the top working in these charities for example um who you know don't really know what they're <laughs> so <laughs> the people they're helping they don't even know they don't know how to because they can't relate i mean i'd like to see next year that 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 these companies and these people sort of put their money where their mouth is because a lot mm -hmm. of prides we've seen this year have been had such diverse lineups for example a lot of smaller ones while these larger prides we're still seeing well even more so now it's this big lineup of a lot of straight 
not mm. it may be or why um cis people on their stage which is great but there needs to be space <laughs> made uh mm. for people mm. of color performers and the month of june was set aside i mean pride month we everyone within the lgbtq plus community pretty much stepped aside and said look we acknowledge the the blm movement needs this space so we step aside and we give our space to them because we recognize you know the, the overlaps and we we, sh we share the same impression in in certain ways and that's great there's that unity and having that unity now i, I really want to see people keep that momentum going i don't want you know corporate companies to then at the end of you know at the end of june typically change their profile picture back from <laughs> the little rainbow that's like, yeah, it's like just, just their logo rainbow. and that that kind of the whole virtue signaling is just not if you're going to do it do it properly but at the same time don't overdo it because i think when you look at things like the gender pay gap um you know diversity on on a, on a board for example don't just go and hire a person of color for your board just because you think oh it's getting a bit white here let's go and do it hire them because they can do the job not because you need a face to mm. sit at your, your table it's not a tick box uh, to be filled exactly you know if you're gonna do it do it if you genuinely can't find um you know a, a female ceo fine at least you've tried if you can't find a person of color for that position fine you try and i think as consumers and as people who use social media we've got to recognize that yes just because we don't see it happen doesn't mean that they're not trying you know behind closed doors in the interview process they might not have enough you know poc applicants because those applicants or potential POC applicants might look at that and think, I, I would not get that job. Mm. So that's when the company needs to show their commitment in other ways, show their commitment through how they ask people to come for interviews, how they advertise those particular roles. Do it that way around so that you can satisfy the public that you are still working on it, still conscious about it but being transparent as well. Mm. We, we're just not getting the applicants. It's not our fault. We're doing better. We're finding other ways of doing it. It is just so multifaceted, isn't it? Because mm. you just can't, like you say, that these companies, obviously, they're so, a lot of the really big companies, well, they're so big that, that there is this kind of like, there's just so many gears going, isn't there, that it, it, it will be this, then they've got to change this, and they've got to change that, then they've got to change that. But as you say, I think presentation is so important and transparency. And I think that's where like social media is good because it does allow that conversation with big companies because it's not you just ringing up like on the helpline complaining. You can yeah. go to Twitter and maybe retweet, say, oh, I wasn't happy with this. Duh, 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 duh. Someone else jumps on it. Someone else jumps on it. And then, I mean, obviously sometimes it, it can get like convoluted and what, but it is conversation nonetheless and engagement nonetheless. And yeah, yeah so that, that's such a good point that, Again, you're going back to that patience that you were talking about earlier with individual people. It's the same patience we need to show for those companies, but obviously yeah. it's so hard not to get angry. <laughs> yeah. really I, like I've, I've been accused of like jumping on a bandwagon, like with BLM, for example, going, uh -huh. going back to that. Just because I don't speak about it on my social media now as much as I did then, Mm. That's because there are other issues that I need to focus on. There's only so much that I can do, mm. but I'm still aware of it. I'm still sharing projects. I'm still, you know, lifting up POC voices wherever I can. But at the same time, I can't go out looking for things to share just because they are POC. Because if I don't agree with what they've said, I'm 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 endorsing them for the wrong reasons. Yeah, and I think people need to just. Be really mindful of that. It's great to, to lift voices, but do it for the right reasons. Don't do it just because, just because. You know, it happened. Um, otherwise, you may as well just stick to the old regime and just, you know, not bother. Um, mm. But th at the same time, if there are other issues, it's fine to park one thing up, focus on something else. If there are intersections, great. If there aren't, that's fine. At least you're always mindful of that, and that's the most important thing. And you can't as much as you'd like to, you can't spread yourself across 
all of the you, if you want to if you want to commit to something you have to really well th- well this is it sorry if you want to help an issue you have to commit to it and you can't mm-hmm. commit to it if you're committing to this that this that and the other you need to because you need to understand it don't you and so and that's through research that's through conversation that's through discussion and so yeah it suddenly become it suddenly very quickly can become performative and it's 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 okay to admit that you don't know everything about a topic or you don't even know about a topic at all Mm -hmm. but just you know just sharing it and saying look i'd love to get on board with this i don't understand it my area of strength is with another cause so what I'm going to do is acknowledge this other one that I don't understand, maybe say that I don't understand, but here are, you know, this is what I've learned about it. Hand that cause over to someone who's better suited at tackling it than you are. Mm-hmm. You don't have to hold on to it just because the world is, you know, I don't know, mad on a particular movement at this stage. It's okay to say this, I, I agree with this movement, but it's not anything that I have any expertise or knowledge in. And if it needs action right now, I can't be the one to, to do that action. So I will pass it on to those who are more readily available. Mm. In the meantime, I've got my other strengths. I'm still willing to learn. But just just opening up and admitting to be human, because yeah. we can't be involved in everything. We can't be experts in everything. And it would be a shame to take someone who's an expert of one particular cause and force them onto something else, because mm. their original cause is then you know less effective mm-hmm. so we've got to we've got to think about who we have within the community within our local community or, or further afield and think well how can we better use like everyone and for their strengths and, and approach it that way around because we need to organize ourselves that way before we can make any change otherwise we are just juggling plates constantly <laughs> and nothing mm-hmm. will ever happen I've definitely felt the world, the weight of the world because of social media, because of all the different sort of problems and which are rightly exposed, discussed, whatnot. But sometimes, yeah, it can be so overwhelming. And I, I do worry that like the generation below who feel that need to tackle everything at once is quite, um, it's a lot. And yeah, I, I think those are really wise words, what you've said to, to organise and to converse and hopefully coming out this next year like you said people will want to come together because they appreciate what they've lost over the past year and i hope to see more sort of community events grassroots movements obviously it's a bit worrying now with what buildings are actually available with so many closing venues but um but yeah i really I mean, stuff it. We don't need a vet. Let's go go to the pub. That's how. That's how <laughs> it all started. <laughs> and also, like with pride events. I mean, when you think about events like that, you think pride. You know, you think Birmingham City Centre, Manchester, London. Yeah. But what about the little community prides? Because yeah. that's where real change happens. Mm. You can't just go straight to the top and want change or or even celebrate change. Yeah. Great, be involved in it, but that change has to happen, starting with you. This was the year of theory. <laughs> right. The year that we took out, learned from home, basically. We work from home, we learn from home. Next year, let's put that theory into practice. Let's mm-hmm. see all those corporate companies doing something about it. Let's see all the people mobilizing and using their voices, using what they've learned this year and see it happen because Mm. if it works next year could be massive massive change all over Mm. um if you if you could be in any venue now it doesn't have to be like a club venue it can be anything and there was a song playing where where would it be and what would the song be (sighs) oh i would say O2 Academy, one in Birmingham, and it would be Architects and one of my favourite tracks of theirs, Doomsday, Mm -hmm. because it absolutely slaps. But at the same time, I I think it's such a beautiful song, both musically, lyrically, and it's one of those songs that you just, you can't not open up and enjoy it. 
and for me I, I miss live music so much so that that would be the one for me so it'd be, it'd be the architects live in birmingham yeah. <laughs> academy yeah. one's such a good venue as well so yeah, they love the sound in there yeah oh that's really good. yeah live gigs that's so good i didn't even think of that when i was thinking about this, that question yeah i want to be in a crowd of throbbing sweaty people to like yeah. beautiful music yeah oh it's lovely <laughs> Well, what a fantastic first episode. I knew as soon as I started this project that I wanted to interview Eva because of the amazing activism she's been producing online. But wow, how many topics did we cover? Eva said last year was the year of theory and that this year, 2021, we should be looking to put those theories into practice. To put into practice what we've learned from listening to those who've cried out for change on our screens, phones and TVs. How a conversation online may be limited but is still a conversation nonetheless. How it's more than just saying black trans lives matter, we have to do more. But Eva said to also have patience. The two seem at odds, but I think Eva again made a really strong point that you cannot fight alone for change. I think we've all felt alone at some point this last year, thinking we must fight every type of oppression that we see pouring out of our phones. Yet we can only truly fight and make a difference when we are committed, educated and organised. And as we discussed in the episode, having been denied human interaction for nearly a year, after the pandemic, it'd be amazing to see people group and gather more so than ever to make that change. I admire Eva so much and I'm so glad she agreed to come on the show with me. If you're not already, make sure to follow her Eva Echo on Instagram. That's E-V-A-E-C-H-0. And her campaign at passiton.campaign. That's passiton.campaign. This has been Couple with Cake Boy, and I'll see you next week for a brand new episode. Music by Joseph Conway, and this episode was funded by Superbia.